All right, hi everybody, and welcome to our Hangout. I'm Staff Sergeant Sarah Schramborg with the United States Army Field Band based in Washington, D.C. We're one of the Army's premier bands. Today we're hanging out with the C.E. King Middle School Band in Houston, Texas, and we're super excited to be working with you guys today. Uh, we have one of our small groups, the Chamber Brass, who is going to play a short uh, performance for you and talk to you a little bit about brass and wind playing and just playing in an ensemble in general. And then at the end, they're going to have time to answer some questions. So hopefully, you'll be thinking of some great questions to ask them when the time comes. Um, in the meantime, without further ado, here are the Chamber Brass. Thank you very much. Hey, my name is Master Sergeant Michael Klima, and we are the Chamber Brass. Um, we are all members of our concert band here at the United States Army Field Band, and we are actually one of about 10 different small chamber ensembles that are pulled from members of the concert band. Um, a little bit about what we do as members of the concert band. Um, we travel the country about 100 days a year playing uh, concerts for the American people. Now, why in the world would we do something like that? Well, we are goodwill ambassadors. We're called the ambassadors of the Army, and we are all soldiers representing soldiers. We represent the professionalism, the dedication, and excellence of every soldier across your Army. So we have a big responsibility to make sure on our end that we, we represent them really well, and we're having a great time here um, being with you today, sharing a little bit about what it is to be a musician, um, things that can make us better um, to enjoy music more, because guess what? We were all in your shoes at one time. Most of us started in either elementary or middle school, and we just ended up loving music so much and playing our instruments that we made a career out of it. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about not just brass playing, we'll, we'll, we'll address a little bit of that, um, but we want to try to be the musician umbrella today, because you are all, all are musicians. Um, we'll find some things that are in common across the wind players, even in the percussion. We do have a nice uh, percussion additive back here that's going to give us some nice colors. Um, but we're going to try to just have some fun, play a little music for you, and. Uh, yeah, just try to find some ways that we can make mu music more enjoyable, accomplish things a little bit faster, and have a whole lot more fun doing it, because that's what music is all about. It's a social event. We get together with our friends, um, sometimes our, our colleagues here, and, and do uh, important jobs across the country. So um, without further ado, let's just move right along. We're going to play some pieces that um, were transcribed for the brass quintet, um, not originally written for this type of instrumentation. So that first piece you heard was a piece by George Friedrich Handel. Uh, so you're looking back into the mid-1700s. Uh, 
very old piece of music, but still a lot of fun to play and listen to. Uh, we're going to move on to another piece by uh, Reinhold Glier. He's a Russian composer back from the mid-1800s. And uh, he wrote a piece uh, for a ballet called The Red Poppy. Now, you probably all know that, that ballet, right? Got it. Okay. But anyways, you're going to know this, this piece, I almost guarantee it. It's called The Russian Sailor's Dance, and it's a great piece that showcases variations, taking a theme, expanding upon it, making it a little bit faster and pretty exciting, and we've got percussion to go with it. So this is uh, Russian Sailor's Dance. Hi everyone, I'm Master Sergeant Matthew Nelson, and I have a quick question for all of you there. Who wants to learn how to play their instrument instantly better in about two minutes? I'm assuming everyone. I can't hear you, but okay, I see some hands. Awesome, okay. We are going to do that by something that we do every day. We're going to do that by breathing, okay? When I say go, I want everyone to take a deep breath as fast as they can. Go. Let it out. Good. Okay, now take a break. This time, when you breathe in, I want you to think of the syllable E when you breathe in. Go. Let it out. Okay, now let's try a different syllable and see if it feels any better when you take a breath. Try the syllable AH when you take a breath in. Go. Let it out. Okay. 
One more, my favorite. Here we go. Let's think of the syllable O when we breathe in. Go. Good. It's that simple. If you guys think of the syllable O when you breathe, you're going to keep your throat nice and relaxed, and you're going to be able to take in a really big breath. Now, here's another trick that I think of when I take a breath. Sometimes we trick ourselves and we're not really taking a really deep breath. So what I think of is I get my tongue and my mouth just a little bit wet, and when I take a deep breath in, I try to feel that cool air go across my tongue. So let's try that. Syllable O. Let's take a nice deep breath and feel the cool air go through the mouth. Ready? Go. Let it out. One more time. Here we go. Go. Let it out. Okay. We're on to the last thing that I think about, okay? I'm actually going to teach you guys what a really, really big breath feels like. When I say go, I want you to let out all the air out of your lungs that you can, okay? And you're going to hold it for probably about five seconds. I'm going to say go again. You're going to let out a little bit more air and hold it. And then I'm going to have you hold it for about 10 seconds. And then you're going to struggle a little bit, but don't take a breath, okay? And when I say go for the third time, take in a lot of air. Okay, here we go. This is going to teach you how to take a really, really big breath. Ready? Go. Blow out all your air. Hold it. Five, four, three, two, one. Blow out some more. Hold it. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Breathe. Wow. <laughs> Feels good, right? You have no choice but to take a really, really big breath. So now you guys know. Keep a syllable O. Feel the air moving through your mouth, and now you know what a really deep breath feels like. We're going to go on to another aspect of brass playing that's going to really help you guys out, too. All right, then. You know, I, I think one important thing to know when you're an instrumentalist, or even a vocalist, is how does your instrument work? How does sound work? Does any, do, we, do we all know how it works? Well, there's kind of the basics of it. What is sound? Sound is vibration, right? Vibrating air. Things that vibrate with low uh, or big, long uh, frequencies are low sounding, and anything with short wavelengths and are very high frequencies. So the way everything works, our percussionist back here, he has a, a tight drum head, and once he hits it, it sets into vibration. The sound comes off of that, vibrates the air, right? Okay, woodwinds, we have reeds. Right? So you put the reed on there, there's a little gap, you blow air across it and it starts vibrating. You can feel that in your mouth, right? That goes through your instrument, creates a color, a sound. Um, brass instruments, we do a little bit different. We use our lips as the vibrating membrane. We put it into a mouthpiece and it vibrates a column of air on the inside of that instrument and it comes out the bell. Now based on how long the instrument is, de determines the color of the sound and how high or low in pitch it. It, uh, it sounds. So obviously the tuba has a very long, long tube on it. So once you unwrap his, once you unwrap his uh, tuba, it's a very long tube, so it's going to be very low sounding. And the trumpets are the one of the shorter instruments, and they sound on the high side. So the other important thing about knowing about that is how do we use that to our advantage? How can we use this knowledge of how our instrument works? Well, with brass playing, I like to take just my mouthpiece. And I figure if I can play my mouthpiece pretty well by itself, once you put it into this amplifier, what comes out should be a lot better uh, if I'm putting in the best product here. So sometimes I like to practice just on the mouthpiece. Um, you know, we have valves that can uh, do these extra lengths of tubing to give us different pitches, but if we're not hearing it and we can't quite control it here, we're just kind of putting guesswork into here. And the instrumental can only do so much for you. So when you want to produce a really beautiful sound or center notes or be in tune, you got to start in your ear, your mind, and through your, through your embouchure. So sometimes I like to do the first thing, kind of like exercising. You want to stretch, limber up. Um, I want to work on just my lips and my breathing, because we just talked about the breathing back here. We, we need to get that to be really efficient and easy. So I'll just take my mouthpiece and blow through it. No sound. This is something you can do early in the morning. Just start getting your breathing working. And then gradually, I'll just start closing my lips. I don't want you to try to think about buzzing if you're a brass player. 
Because then you start putting tension in here and you're, you're really kind of clamping down and going and you're choking off that beautiful sound that you want to get. So I just try to take that fat airstream and just blow it into a buzz and see how nice and rich, how vibrating sounded can I make it. Once it gets nice and loud and rich, I know I've hit that nice sweet spot where the lips like to balance. Now, on top of that, play music on this or, or pitches. Play a scale or something. You can sit at a piano and check your notes as you go up to make sure you're playing in tune. You could even get together with other people and just play random notes. Everybody buzz just what you would normally do to warm up. Or we could just all match a pitch so that we know that we're kind of ear training. Well, we know how to do that. Well, what if we played some music? Okay, I'm going to give them a big round of a hand, a round of applause. That's got some great harmony back there. So in a nutshell, we're trying to breathe really well. We want to put in a, a, a good product into our instrument and work on our sound, our tone quality. That's kind of the number one thing you want to do before you pick up your instrument. It's not about, I want to play high, low, fast, or slow. It's what's the beauty of the sound that's coming out. Okay, well, speaking of, I think everyone knows what that, that little melody was, right? Amazing Grace. Well, I did a little research on Amazing Grace, and, you know, I didn't know much about it, but it's a very old hem tune, um, written back in the late 1600s, 1682, I believe, by a, a, a minister, an a English minister, preacher, uh, named James Newton. And anyways, the, the story that, that, that goes is he was actually on a slave ship off the coast of Ireland, and there was a huge storm. Everyone thought they were going to die, the ship was going to founder, and somehow they miraculously got through the storm. And when he went ashore while they're fixing the ship, he realized he really didn't have a very good life at that point, wasn't a very good person. And he said, God has saved me somehow. He has spared a wretch like me. And he started writing down the, the lyrics, which were eventually put into uh, music form. So we are going to play a version of Amazing Grace um, that's a, made famous by the Canadian Brass Quintet. Um, and this is a little different style. It's in three parts. It kind of opens up into a, a nice... Uh, blues solo that I get to play and then we're all going to join together in kind of a gospel feel and then we're going to kick it off into a Dixieland feel to kind of have a happy ending to this. So this is Amazing Grace by the Canadian Brass.
Thank you very much. We're going to take just a quick little break. How about introducing everyone in the group here? So you know who I am. I'm Master Sergeant Michael Klima. I'm originally from Sartell, Minnesota. Uh, I've been in the band about 17 years, and I'm the, the leader of this group right here. So we're just going to go around and do a quick introduction of everyone. Hi, I'm Sergeant First Class Nick Althaus. I'm originally from Salem, Ohio. I've been with the field band almost nine years now. play trumpet in the chamber brass and the concert band. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Staff Sergeant Becky McLaughlin. I've been in the Army Field Band for just over four years, as of a couple days ago. And I'm originally from Columbia, Maryland. You met me already. I am Master Sergeant Matthew Nelson, originally from Oconomowoc, Wisconsin, and I've been in this band just over 15 years. Hey, everybody. I'm Sergeant First Class Todd Sterniolo. Uh, I've been in the band 13 years. I'm originally from Hagerstown, Maryland, and uh, I think that's about, oh, that's about it. Up next is our percussionist. Hello, everyone. I'm Staff Sergeant Derek Stoltz, and I'm originally from Princeton Junction, New Jersey, so not too far away from here. And because I am the percussionist, they have asked me to talk about rhythm. I'm also the new guy in the group, so I think that might be why it is, too. But Rhythm is something that I think is very important. And one question I have for you, has anyone seen how we start out any of our pieces? Has anyone seen what might be happening to start the pieces? Do we have someone up here waving a baton like you might have in the band? We don't. We have someone here who has started almost all of our pieces so far. Uh, Sergeant Althouse over here, usually, plays at the beginning of each piece, at least he has so far. And I want you to watch what he does when he's about to start a piece. We all watch him. Let's see what he does. Did you see that? His trumpet moved a little bit, and maybe you could hear, I don't know if you could hear, but he took a breath that was audible enough for the entire group to hear. So this is how we start together without a conductor. OK, so now we've started the piece, but how do we stay together? There's something, I don't know if any of you might have heard of it, it's called subdividing. It's kind of a big word, but as a percussionist, we're always subdividing. I think the brass players are doing it too. We find the shortest note that we play in the piece. This next piece, the shortest note we play are eighth notes. And we say, okay, we've got all these eighth notes, we should be thinking eighth notes in our head. So we might count the piece normally, one, two, one, two, but in our head we're thinking one and two and one and two and. So we've got a piece here called Yankee Doodle. I think most of you are familiar with it. And we're going to play it through five times. I actually don't play on this one, so I'm going to get out of the way. But we play it through five times. And we start with everyone playing a few notes, and then it gets traded around the ensemble. And by the time we get to the fifth time, 
everyone is only playing one note. So they really have to think these eighth notes really loudly in their head and make sure that everyone knows exactly what the rest of the group is doing and plays perfectly in the right time. They're pretty good at this. Let's see how they do. Thank you once again. I'm Staff Sergeant Becky McLaughlin, and it's not just about the horn, the French horn. It's not just about trumpet. It's not just about our individual instruments. It's about our ensemble. So we are playing in a quintet, and we have our added percussionist. But when you're playing in a full concert band or a full orchestra, you need to be thinking about your role as your uh, instrument or as you uh, decide, all right, what part am I playing in this piece and how can I bring that out or how can I just support whoever is important and really think about, okay, how can I make this more about the ensemble and less about the individual? So here are some things I think about. The first thing I think about is who has the melody, who has the counter melody, who has the harmony, who has rhythmic support, what part is happening as I'm playing and what part am I? So as a French horn player, we play a lot of marches. We're a military band, we do a lot of marches. So I'm primarily rhythmic support. Do you think I should be the loudest person playing? Probably not. So I need to think, okay, how can I balance with everyone else around me to make this piece and the ensemble sound as best as it can? So what we're going to do right now is we're gonna talk about balance in our ensemble and how we go about determining who needs to be louder, who needs to be softer. Uh, maybe if you have heard this piece before, you can chime in once we're finished. But we're going to play a section of a patriotic tune. And I want you to listen for our balance. And hopefully afterwards you can tell me who was playing too loud and who should have been playing a little bit louder and see if we can fix it. All right? So this is a patriotic piece I am sure you will recognize. So who knew what section uh, that was from, what piece? Who can tell me? What did you hear? Okay, so that was from God Bless America, from the mountains to the prairies. And we had our low brass players who had the melody. Now who could hear the melody come out when our trumpet players and myself were playing so loud and so far, uh, so above them volume wise. That's really not a, not a great balance that we had. So we're gonna try this one more time. And thinking about balance, we're going to bring out whoever has 
the melody at the time and see if you can always hear the melody and whoever doesn't have the melody we're going to bring back down. So another thing that goes with balance is listening across the ensemble. So I'm not just listening to my own part when I play it and thinking, okay, I sound great. Listen to me. I'm thinking, okay, this other person is playing right now too. How can I support them? How can I make them sound great as well? So this is God Bless America. We're going to play the entire piece this time. And we're going to be thinking about listening across, listening to each other, uh, supporting who has the melody, and accompanying uh, as uh, an appropriate volume level, our appropriate dynamics. And uh, hopefully we can make this sound nice and balanced. So hopefully that time did we do okay with our balance so you could hear the melody come out and God bless America and the rhythmic support was a little bit under them. Great. So now we're going to open this up to you. I hope you've been thinking of some questions to ask us. So let's see if we can turn the mic over to a student who has been thinking of a question for anyone in the ensemble. It doesn't have to be me. And let's, let's take it away. Oh, Bria. Um, I'll, I'll speak in How long did you decide? When did you decide decided that you were going to do that? Can you come up towards the microphone wherever it is in your classroom? I got part of the question, I think. When did you decide to when did I decide I wanted to be a part of the ensemble? Um, I started playing French horn when I was eight. So I've been playing for 20 years. You can do the math. I wanted to be in the military because I really associated with the military and I, once I got out of college, I got my degree in music education. I really wanted to perform. And so I auditioned for the army bands and I thought to myself, oh, well, this is a really great thing because not only can I serve my country and I can be in the army and do something that I will be really proud of, but I also get to be a musician at the same time. So I've been in the army a little over six years and a lot of us have been in, in this particular ensemble for most of our uh, playing careers. Does anyone else have a, an answer as to when they decided they wanted to be in this ensemble? Uh, most of us started playing when we were in elementary school or middle school, so we've been really hoping for a performance job for a really long time. We spent a lot of time taking private lessons, practicing, uh, really working on the, uh, the things that you need to do in order to get to this point, so practicing auditioning for someone. It's not just about how you can play by yourself in a room, but how you can play for others. And I, 
I don't want to just speak for myself when I say all of these things, but it, it takes a long time to get to the point that all of us are at. So it just takes a lot of hard work and dedication and, and time just working on it, playing, doing what you can. Is there another question? Mariah. Mariah. Um, <coughs> So she wants to know, to know why, why mentor and mentor would be going to be the brass quintet. She wants to know the history of the brass quintet, why these specific instruments were put into the brass quintet. Ah, the history of the brass quintet. Well, <laughs> our percussionist doesn't want to answer that. It's, uh, what, does anyone have a, a good historical answer for how this came about? This is a Sergeant Althouse. Yeah, I, th I think small chamber ensembles have been around for a long time, uh, going back, you know, in, in Western music history and, you know, in the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, and even vocal ensembles and quartets. Uh, and, uh, although this is a quintet, I think there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of music transcribed for the brass quintet that was originally four voice, mostly taken from the string quartet and uh, vocal quartet literature. Um, so I think in any ensemble, you know, if you're trying to mimic the, the voice, uh, you need sopranos, altos, tenors, and bass. So in the brass quintet, you have two soprano voices and can add harmony in the upper register. Uh, alto voice would be kind of the French horn, one of the inner, inner voices. Also in the inner voices would be the tenor voice in the trombone, and the bass line would be the tuba. So that, if that makes sense, it, it's just um, in any small ensemble, you need to cover all the, all the different vocal ranges. Great. So in the field band, we have three brass quintets, three woodwind quintets, and then we have all sorts of other ensembles. And the reason we like chamber music so much, you have so many different types of pieces you can play, so a variety of music, which is really fun for us. And also, when you play in the band, you're often playing next to other people who have your same part. So a good way to really get good at uh, your own part and listening across the band when someone else isn't doubling you is to play in chamber music. It, it's really, um, I, I think, one of the best things you can do to learn how to be a better musician and play with other people, to be in a chamber ensemble. So get together with your friends, find some duets, find some trios, and find a group that you can play with. And, and it, it's always really fun, I think. Is there another question? Delaney, go ahead. Stand up. Hold up. My question is, why did, why did they why did they have several trumpets? Why did they have several trumpets? Oh well, I'm gonna go to our one of our trumpet players for that. This is Sergeant Aldhouse again. Hi. Um, I guess we have so many different trumpets uh, just to get different slightly different colors of sound uh, the, the trumpets that I, I have with me this is a standard B flat trumpet and this is an E flat trumpet you can see that it the lead pipe on it is a lot shorter and overall the, the instrument is shorter so it's pitched a fourth higher than the B flat trumpet uh, sounds a little a little more bright a little more clear Then we have the piccolo trumpet, and it's pitched in B-flat, so an octave higher than the big B-flat trumpet. Uh, they're all pretty, played pretty much the same way. As, uh, the smaller instruments are just kind of an extension of the range of the big B-flat trumpet, uh, but each one is, is used just to get slightly different uh, timbre, a little bit different sound. Kind of like, uh, you know, if you're painting, you know, you like to have more than one color. Same with us, making, making sounds, we like to have more than one sound sometimes. So uh, between the different trumpets and our mutes, we, we have a variety of tools to change our sound when we, we need to or the music calls for it. Great. Let's have another question. Oscar, you got a question? Oscar, you got a question? Yes, I would like to know when... When did you decide to join the U.S. Army? Yes, yeah, so maybe we can get like a history from each of you on when you decided that going to the Army was what you wanted to do to play your instrument. 
Sure, well, you already kind of heard from me. I'll just say again, I went to Indiana University and I studied music education. And I decided to join the Army because I, I knew that it would be a great decision as a stable job and also a really meaningful job. I, I think you all know if you're from a hometown you're really proud of, or if you're on a sports team, you're really proud of. You feel something that is bigger than yourself that makes you um, feel meaningful. And so I like being a part of the Army because I feel like I'm representing the country. I'm, I truly, as a musician in this ensemble, I'm an ambassador for all soldiers. And wearing this uniform, you're representing the United States. So that's really meaningful full to me but being a musician is also just fun I love it so let's open it up to Master Sergeant Klima well let's see I was actually uh, going to graduate school and studying to be a trumpet college professor and uh, those jobs are also hard to come by and uh, I knew a couple people in this particular ensemble and I thought well I'll, I'll audition and give it a try I actually won the job 17 years ago thought I'd try it for three years and of course I loved it so much that I'm still here um, I come from a military family as well uh, my dad was a, a paratrooper back in the during the Korean Korean War and a lot of my extended family uh, were active in World War II supporting the war effort uh, both in Navy and Army so So um, my reason for joining the Army is uh, that um, when I was in college uh, uh, studying to be a high school band director, my teacher was in, had been in the Marine Band for 20 years, and I always had the sound of band and military. They, they always kind of went together for me. So whenever I saw that there was an opening in a premier military band, I thought, I got to take it and I got to win it. So that's why I'm here, uh, and I've been here for 13 years. Hi, almost the same story for myself. My band director in high school always played premier band CDs from the Army Band to the Marine Band to the Air Force Band. It didn't matter. Every time I heard them, they sounded just so, so good, and that I definitely knew I wanted to be in one someday if I could. So I went to Indiana University along with Becky. She was a little after me. And um, after seven auditions for the premier bands, I finally won this job, and I've been here ever since. I think a lot of us up here have family history in the military. My great-grandfather was in World War II. My grandfather was in World War II, both sides. Uh, my father was in the Army for a short amount of time, um, not as a musician, but uh, it makes me very proud to know that I'm continuing a tradition of military service in my family. Um, I started banging on pots and pans and singing in the bathtub when I was very, very little. Thankfully, I own the only tape of a recording of me singing in the bathtub so nobody else will ever hear it. But um, I knew that I wanted to go to school for music. It was something that I just absolutely loved and I wanted to turn my hobby into my career. And uh, as it turns out, my wife actually got a job with a military band first. She ended up in the Naval Academy Band in Annapolis, Maryland. And I moved out here with her and was freelancing, playing with orchestras in the area, like the Baltimore Symphony and smaller pickup orchestras. And auditioned for numerous different ensembles, both in this area and further away. I have taken 37 professional auditions from small, tiny little orchestras to big orchestras to premier bands in the military. And this, I believe, was my fifth audition for a premier military band and it was the happiest day of my life besides my wedding when I got the call and was told that I was accepted into the U.S. Army Field Band. So it's an absolute honor and it's wonderful to be able to play with great brass musicians in the chamber brass. Well thank you everyone so much for sharing your stories. Um, and thank you to the King Middle School Band and Mrs. Hoisiger and Mr. Harkness and all of your great students for um, being such a wonderful audience and for your thoughtful questions and thank you to the Chamber Brass for sharing uh, their beautiful music with us today. I hope you learned a lot and I hope you enjoyed the performance. Um, on behalf of the U.S. Army Field Band, uh, we are so delighted to have been invited into your school to spend this time with you today online um, and we encourage you and anyone watching at home to visit our website, armyfieldband.com, 
Um, there's so many free recordings and resources on there, videos um, for you and your library. Um, and find us on social media. Check us out um, on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Um, we're everywhere. So we'd love to catch up with you on any of those platforms. And the Chamber Brass has one more performance for you. Um, and we have, if anyone is watching at home that would like to have us come into your school, you can find out that information about Hangouts on our website at armyfieldband.com backslash Hangouts. So thanks again and enjoy. Go ahead, guys. Hey, we have one thing we'd like to say to you guys. Okay, you ready? Thank you for your service. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, we just want to quick introduce our last piece. Uh, it's a transcription of a wind ensemble tune or a band tune. So this might be something you might play in your future. Um, it's, a, it's a piece that gives a lot of imagery. It's, it's programmatic. Okay, so you're going to think about what does this remind you of. Um, it's by Philip Parker and it's called Clowns. Thank you much for having us. Thank you. 